So please welcome uh, Paul Verhoeven and Casper Van Dijk. So, um, of the of the films in your career that have been sort of misunderstood or underappreciated at the time of release, where does this one sit for you? Uh, uh, yeah, there was well, perhaps uh, Showgirls, of course. More so. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, sh Showgirls and Starship Troopers, one after the other, didn't help me. No. <laughs> we were we were talking about this earlier, and um, it's it's kind of I don't know. I think it's hard to see why, well maybe it's not hard to see why, but this film was very widely uh, misread at the time of its release. You were both talking about presenting the film and the kinds of questions that were coming up. Um, can you just recap for us a little bit about what, what, what that was like presenting Starship Troopers in 1997? What were people, what were people saying to you? Well at that time it, it was uh, in general by the, uh, uh, certainly by American critics, but later in Europe it was the same situation. It was bashed because it was accused of being uh, neo-fascist or neo-Nazi. In fact, in big uh, American newspapers, uh, not even a, 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 as a review, as a film review, but as a redactional article, I think, was Washington Post or Wall Street Journal, uh, where they said that this is a very dangerous movie because it promotes uh, fascism and Nazism, and these two, the writer and the director, are neo-fascist. And um, and that was, uh, let's say, I thought that there was perhaps an American overreaction. But when I went to uh, Europe uh, with Casper, we went to um, to all the European countries, but especially the countries that had been fascist, Italy and Germany hated the movie. The press did. Uh, yeah, they were really, really attacking it left, right, and center. So it was perhaps a, a, a general, uh, let's say, a rejection of the movie. And um, I think what people, what the critics at that time, absolutely did not see, that there was a double narrative in it. There is a narrative, really, which is saying, these are wonderful guys, and they fight for their country, and they are really heroes, and they're supporting each other, and they are wonderful, and they and they go to win. And it is one of the last things of the, of the movie is, is saying they'll fight and they will win, basically. And so um, that, uh, that element was coming, of course, of the original novel by Robert Heinlein. So uh, it was not something we invented, we took that from the novel. Uh, that, was the ma that was the first narrative. The, but there was a second narrative that was at Neumeyer, was the writer of the movie, and, and John Davidson, the producer, and me, where we were also fighting with the book. Because the book of Robert Heinlein, science, uh, one of the, at that time, uh, important science fiction writers, is militaristic and fascist. I mean, he, his philosophy is that way. And we were, our, our philosophy was really different. Still, we wanted to, do t to tell the story of uh, the, a really wonderful, adventurous story about these young boys and, bo and, and girls fighting bugs, but we also wanted to show that these people are really in their heart, or without knowing it, I would say, they're on their way to fascism. So it was like telling one story is these guys are great and wonderful heroes, heroes and the other story was, by the way, they're fascist. I well, that was not so much uh, understood. I think that's exactly what people had a hard time with, right? Because this, this sense, this idea that a film like this, it's usually very easy to locate like how you identify uh, with the with the hero, um, and here your heroes are members of a fascist army. So I think that like obviously short circuits the way a viewer. Yeah, but of course we all know that the people in Germany in 30, uh, and Italy in these years of the 30s were really uh, applauding all that, you know. So I think we, uh, I think we, we wrote, let's say, uh, one narrative that basically was saying yes to it, and another narr narrative saying, yeah, but it's not, uh, but realize what you're admiring. And I think that was extremely unusual, of course, to do that. I mean, it still is. I think to have a narrative where you say, where you seduce, 
by purpose, of course, where you seduce the audience to go with your heroes, and then basically p suddenly showed the audience that what you have been admiring is perhaps really something okay, it might be evil. And I think that was, let's say, uh, what made it nearly impossible at that time for people to, let's say, uh, to accept the movie. Casper, do you recall uh, when you were, you know, working, um, just preparing the film and, and, and discussing uh, discussions with Paul? Did this did this come up very much? Just like discussing the film on a thematic level, talking about it as a satire or fascism, or was that not part of the conversation? You know, they 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 gave me the script and they had an audition for it, and uh, that didn't come up per se in the conversation, but you're reading the script and you're, a, I was a fan of, of Paul's beforehand. I was a fan of his films and, and the way he, um, the way he was on set for me going into this. I mean, this man was the first man on set, the last man off, always working, he had everything storyboarded out and we really just did what he wanted. And, and there was a couple times where I was, I'd be like, I wasn't sure, but he's like, just say it, it's great, this is great and it's funny, this is great. <laughs> and he was right. This, um, I think this film, like, like all of your films, I think the ones that were not appreciated at the time, um, have been sort of rehabilitated. I think people, people caught up with them. They were you know, in, in some ways ahead of their time. When did you sense the tide turning with Starship Troopers? Because now it's a film that obviously is a real, it's a real cult favorite. Casper, you were saying you, you present the film often these days, and you know, it's a role that's he very... He that all the time. All the time. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't Johnny Rico before... Uh, I did Starship Troopers, but there isn't a day that goes by that somebody doesn't... I'm at the gas station, somebody will go, Rico! Uh, and <laughs> you know what to do. But I think it took a couple of years. It was, uh, <coughs> I won't say, uh, because that sounds horrible, but, but, but it was, of course, after what happened in New York, uh, that people were starting to look at the movie in a bit different way. I think, um, so I would say the beginning of the 20th century, of 21st century. But um, uh, by the circumstances, by what happe had, had happened at that time, I think they realized that we were um, telling a story on the, on, uh, 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 that had to be taken at, in, at two levels. And, and the, first, the second level that uh, we discussed, uh, that we, I talked about a minute ago, was only, uh, let's say, uh, at that time that they started to look at the second level in a serious way. I think they probably, when they were seeing the movie the first time, they, if you see, for example, a scene where uh, there is a, 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 a woman and, and with a couple of kids, basically, it's, it's a, in one of the newsreels, of that's the, the fake newsreels that are interspersed in the movie. They, they basi they, and, and it's all about fighting big bucks. And it, but then you see a woman that basically uh, uh, tries to have the children to, uh, uh, to kill uh, cockroaches. And the, and the woman gets completely crazy and says, yeah, kill them, kill them. And it says, kill your enemy, isn't it? I mean, so I think th th that these elements were there and they were very visibly there that we were saying, well, these people are, let's say, hysterical, you know? These people that are going to war, they are hysterical. And they like it, but they're, they're hyster hysterical. That was, but no, at that time that the movie came out, I think that was completely not seen. This, this, this sort of was kind of comedy or whatever, or bad comedy probably. Yeah, well, because there, there's people in the press that didn't that said they didn't get it, and then then like I I just did a panel last week where the guy said that he panned it, he panned the movie when it first came out, and that then he went back and rewatched it, and now it's in one of his top three films of all time. But he said at first he just didn't understand the sense of humor and he didn't understand the satire. He didn't get it at all. He didn't see those elements. He just he kind of washed over them. And then he went back and he went, oh. And now it's one of his third. It just was so interesting to see. But it's like, thanks a lot for the review the first time around. <laughs> yeah, it was difficult. And, but it, I think what was, what was important for us, for at Numai and I and, and John, John Davidson, was <coughs> this idea that we really were fighting, we were fighting with the novel. We tried to do one thing and do the other thing at the same time. And that was, uh, if we succeeded or not, but that was the idea. And we didn't want to go, let's say, say this philosophy we support. It was this, this philosophy exists 
and perhaps we are, of course, we are not talking about Buenos Aires. Eh? I mean, the movie is about Buenos Aires. I mean, we are talking about the United States, of course. We were not all, I mean, we situated it in Buenos Aires, but we were, as, if you see the movie, you understand that it's not about that, you know. It's really about possibilities in the United States sure. that exist and basically, and, uh, and are more visible now than even uh, 20 years ago. I'm not Buenos Aires. <laughs> I'm not Buenos Aires. I'm not from Buenos Aires. No. Huh. <laughs> Why did you do that? The book wasn't, uh, the book wasn't set in Buenos Aires, was it? Yes, yes, it was, was. Uh, 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 fascistic. No, Buenos, it was Buenos Aires in the book. Yeah. It was Buenos Aires. We took that from the book, okay. but we, we, we were talking about something else. Yeah, yeah. we didn't say that, but we, of course we were talking about something else. Um, Casper, you've, uh, I think you were, you were in one of the sequels, right? I was in the number, thir I was in the number three. I wasn't in number two. Um, how did that experience compare, you know, just working on one of the sequels versus the original with, with Paul? Well, I, I love Ed Neumeyer a lot, um, but it, you know, I, I loved, I, I loved the opportunity to go back there. It was interesting just because people, when I put the uniform back on, they just were like, "Oh my God, Johnny Rico," and but I, I get that all the time, even at the gas station. I said so. Uh, it was just, it was awesome. But uh, you know, it's it's Paul Verhoeven that cha changed me by getting me in and Ed Neumeyer at, in the first one, and and there is really no comparison between them. But it was fun to see that Ed put the humor back in the third one a little bit, and I think he put it a little over the top. And of course, don't forget the first one was made for a hundred million dollars, the second and third one for ten. So there is a real difference there. <laughs> I mean, that you should take in consideration, you know, for $10 million, you cannot do what you can do with 100 million, clearly. And so I th they, they could not get to really ever to the visual, uh, let's say, uh, uh, exaggerations that basically are visible in, 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 uh, in number one. I mean, there was no money to do that, you know. You were f fully aware. They had to shoot in South Africa, I think, eh, to make yeah, it. Yeah, we, we shot Starship Troopers yeah. 3 in South Africa, and they, they right. uh, shot the second one. And they took the humor out of the second one, I think, too. Yeah. Um, I guess I should ask that question. How did you get away with making this $100 million film? Every time I see this, it's kind of a well, uh, uh, Making a $100 million movie is not a, diff it's not a problem. No, this one in particular. <laughs> I mean... Uh, if you re read the script, you think if you want to do that well, it's hundred million dollars. I mean, hundred million dollars is uh, really cheap nowadays. You know, the, a lot of these movies are made for two hundred or three hundred million. I mean, we succeeded to do this kind, this movie that is so subversive and politically incorrect, you could say. I mean, we receive. Uh, we, if it was possible to do that because. The regime in S at Sony, where we started the movie, changed every three, four months. <laughs> so we had Mike Medavoy, who greenlit the movie. Then we had uh, uh, Mark Platt. Then we had Mark Kenton. Then we had Cooper. And finally, we got John Kelly and Amy Pascal. And, and basically, it's only at the end of that whole process, these two years, nobody ever looked at the rushes uh, because they had no time because they were fired every three, four months. <laughs> so we got away with it because nobody saw it. You know? And then when it was done, I remember Lucy Fischer, who was vice president at that time, looking at me and saying, well, these are Nazi flags. And I remember saying, yeah, but it's a different color, really. <laughs> they were stalled, at st uh, they were flabbergasted that this movie was made, you know, <laughs> and they postponed it immediately be, uh, because they had other, uh, uh, we were supposed to go out in July, but then they basically they pushed it backwards uh, to September or October. No, I mean, November 7th. Uh, yeah, they, they, they didn't know how to handle it when they really finally saw it, you know. They had no... <laughs> It's amazing, of course, but it could only because every every uh, CEO there basically left after three months. Yeah, that's the real reason. Yeah. So it's like Phil Tippett, who, d who did all the uh, animals, say the most. It's the most expensive art movie ever made. Earlier tonight, when we were talking about Robocop, you were saying that that was your first, um, you know, full American film. You had you were new to the country and new to the system, and and you know you 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 were really relying on what the script gave you in terms of how it related to American culture and politics. By this time, with Starship Troopers, I assume you were a little more 
Yeah, the there was uh, certainly uh, t 10 years later and had been studying and, and, and uh, American politics much more close up. And so I think when we were working on the, on the script, um, it was more a dialogue then that between Ed Numari and me. And I remember we all these things that are, uh, are uh, let's say, strange or funny or satirical or ironic, uh, you will see that. Um, um, we, we invented them laughing, really. We were laughing at our, at our own proposals, you know, and when we were showing, let's say, uh, ch young children fighting together, a uh, uh, gun in their hands and all that stuff, and immediate, then de no, no trial, just uh, death sentence, well, uh, immediately, and all. I mean, we took that all from Texas, basically, ever, um, <laughs> where Bush was then governor, really. But I mean, so on all honesty, we did. I, mean, I remember when we were, were writing it, we were laughing all the time. I mean, so we didn't try to say we are going to make a really, uh, let's say, political, uh, philosophical statement. It came really in our fight with Robert Heinlein's book. We really came to that because that was our protection. That was basically the other side of what we were claiming that these are heroes. That, that was, uh, let's say, came in in a very organic way in our resistance to accept this militaristic, fascistic philosophy. So it's interesting, as you were saying earlier, if people were in the earlier screening, that the new Starship Troopers is actually an attempt to get closer to Heinlein, basically to make a, a more fascist film. Uh, well, that's yeah, they but they're basically following the times, yeah. That's what they said, oh, well, they film. Very appropriate, yeah. I mean, it's up to date, you know. Yeah. You know, what's interesting for me is that this movie, you know, it's attracted both the right and the left. Mm -hmm. I get people that are, are, are far right that come up to me and that love it, and then people that are far left that love it, and they say that it's their film. And I hear that Clinton loved this movie a lot, right? And then, so Clinton loved this, and he was watching in, in, in his war room, um, and he said, oh, wait a minute, that's the goo, the goo's coming up. And then I was on a flight to... Washington DC and somebody was talking to me about Heinlein and I was reading another script and I kept flipping through just reading and and he talked to me for like five minutes He goes oh, where are you going? I'm like well, I'm going to the White House for this charity event um, And he said oh well enjoy it I've been there for seven years and I look over and he'd been talking to me about Heinlein and how much he loves Starship Troopers and it was Carl Rove uh, Wow, oh god um, <laughs> uh, Maybe we should ask you a political question. Um, your, your last two films, you know, we, you, you, they were Dutch and French films, Black Book and L. Um, you, but you've lived or spent a good part of your time in America for like 30 years now. Are you planning to make an American film? You seem like kind of the perfect filmmaker for the age of Trump in some ways. Sure, no, I would love to make an American movie. I made these European movies because I couldn't get, get a job here. I mean, I couldn't find, let's put it this way, I could not find a movie, a, a script that was for me on the level, be it Basic Instinct or Starship Troopers or Robocop. I could not find that. What I got from, my, from everybody from the studios or agents or whatever was always, let's say, I have done it already. I mean, uh, sci always science fiction, more action, more science fiction, action. And I wanted to do something different. And, and finally, in 2002, after making Hollow Man, basically, that, that I felt uh, was finally a movie where, that had no signature at all anymore, I decided that I could not, should not go that direction. I should stop making the, a movie that the studios wanted. I decided to make a movie that I wanted. And that was very difficult. And ultimately, I went to, to Holland uh, to make Black Book which is a movie that I wanted to do, as, as was Elle. So it has been, uh, of course there is, is, is uh, uh, American movies that I would love to, ma to make. I mean, see, if you see Starship Troopers or, or, or Robocop or, or Basic Instinct, you see how I much used American talent all over the place. It's, uh, I mean, this country is, has an enormous amount of talent before the camera, in front of the camera, behind the camera. And it's always has been, let's say, a pleasure to work in the United States. But of course, for me, it also has to be the pleasure of being innovative and that I do something that I have not done before. I didn't do sequels. I didn't do sequels to neither to Robocop or Total Recall or Basic Instinct have all been asked for me uh, uh, or Starship Troopers. 
I don't want to do it because for me it has to be something new. It has to be an adventure, something I have not done. I have to be in fear for the project. I have to be uh, f feeling anxiety because I don't know how to do it because I have not done it before. And I refuse to do things that I've done because I know that I won't be inspired by fear anymore. I will just do it because I know how to do it. You know. And this, this is why he needs to make more films here. It's, it's amazing because he, when, when we shot Starship Troopers, he was, he was the first one on the set, the last one off the set. Everything was meticulously done, taken care of, and he had the writer on the set, which I, this was, for me, I was, it was one of my first films. It was an experience that I thought that this was the norm. And he had more energy than anybody. And sometimes, it, I, I guess that's scary for people because there's too many yes men or women uh, in Hollywood that you know won't listen to somebody that that is just I mean his his passion for me was it was just awesome to be a part of and it's still to see it right now he's got the same passion so for me it hasn't changed in watching him in 20 years. All right, um, before we start the film, we're going to let the audience ask questions. Um, we, we can only take two questions. Raise your hands only if it's a good question. <laughs> um, okay, right. Yep. You. Mm -hmm. The shower scene in Strush. It was my first movie boobs. Um, Your first movie boobs? My first movie boobs. Okay. As I grew older, I kind of, I grew to love it because it's like egalitarian. It's sort of, even if it, it, it is in the 70s, it's like we're all the same, inherently sort of feminist in a way. And I'm just curious about the motivation behind the choice of Well, I mean, I tried to do that um, if you have seen uh, this, this evening Robocop when you get to. Uh, in one of the first scenes, there is a, in the when you're among the cops there in the dressing room, there is a woman there. You see her breast, but, and and but I, I shot it in a way that you didn't see it very well, uh, by coincidence. And then I thought I, sh I, I would make a, a, let's say come back to that as Starship Troopers, but of course it was by an act, act, by let's say. Uh, putting forward an extreme version of being that there is no difference between men and women. That was the idea, that this is possible in this wonderful fascistic utopia, if you want to call it that way. <laughs> Everybody is really equal. <laughs> of course, real, uh, realize that basically Hitz, Hitler's Nazism is national socialism. Yeah? So Hitler was even a socialist. So and I, I was trying to, to extend this utopia to that. Of course, it's exaggeration, but I thought it was kind of fun to do it, and, and especially because Casper uh, uh, was the first one, basically, to take his trousers off. <laughs> no, in fact, you were me. the first one to take your trousers off. I think he's got the story wrong. Yeah, I got the story wrong because I did it first. Yes, you did. <laughs> but I mean, I, I saw it was really that motivation to, I mean, of course, I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that, be, that men and women are completely equal, you know. Absolute no doubt in any way, in, as I've said many times in my el own elementary school, and high school, university, they were all better than me. So I don't see any difference. There is, a, of course, there's a biological difference. That's it. For the rest, it's all the same. All the abilities are there of both, for both sexes. And, and so to, to, I try to, to put that into some metaphor with this uh, scene in, in, in Starship Troopers. Yeah, sure. You've always had a love for, you always had strong women characters though too. You always have really strong, tough women. Yeah, I'm married as she's here. I'm married to one, you know. Yeah, because well, it's true, because when you first read Robocop, you and my daughters are similar. Yeah, but you threw RoboCop out, didn't you? Huh? When you first got the script for RoboCop. Uh, yeah, I told them that. Uh, oh, that, you did? Uh, that, that I threw it, uh, yeah, but that I threw it away, and my wife corrected me, you know. She read it and said, you're, you're, you're wrong. You have to read it again. Finally, I started to read it again, and then I started to see it. But, um, so you can thank her. I have to thank her many, many times. I was, I was telling the audience. <laughs> Martine. Uh, there, in the back. 
No, I mean, she made me come to the United States, you know, when the difficulties started in Holland with, uh, let's say, subsidies and m money and all that stuff. Um, uh, she was the one, I was afraid, I wouldn't have done it, but she said, okay, I'll take the kids, I'll take care of the kids. And, and uh, you make the movie, Robocop, in this case. Uh, she was the one, basically, that p pushed me to, to use Arnold Schwarzenegger in faith. And I showed her the, the, the first tape, of the first, uh, uh, let's say, audition of, of, uh, of Casper van Dien. Eh? As she approved. <laughs> she asked me I to mean, take my she bed. has been extremely important, as have my daughters and whatever. In fact, if you look at L, you'll see that uh, the woman there, the main character, Isabelle Huppert, um, is, is head of a, a company, uh, is the CEO of a company that makes video games. And that idea, uh, in, in, the, in the original novel, she is just the, the CEO of a group of writers, which is not very visual, of course. And when I put that uh, on the table, that it was kind of boring to, to use that for a movie, um, my youngest daughter, who is a painter, said, why don't you make her the CEO of a video game company? So I think my family has always been extremely inspiring, supportive, and, and, and have basically made me push me to make decisions that I didn't have the guts to do decide myself. Okay, one more, one final good question. Yes, you. Uh, just, I think it's just uh, a comment about the, the relevance, um, you know, the prescience of these films. You know, there are science fiction films from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and, and he's saying how uh, relevant they seem today and whether that was something that might have crossed your mind when you were making them. Well, it's, uh, uh, let's say, it's very different. I mean, there is, of course, we're living in an extremely, in, uh, uh, you can call it I interesting or scary uh, uh, times. Um, and I would, uh, of course, you would like to do something about that too, you know, you would try, but I think if you go too, too directly into the now, you have no distance to, to, to really treat something like that, you know, then you need to have a certain, certain distance t as an artist to the project and not be in the middle of it. And so basically, so what I did when this all happened uh, lately, I started to read about Adolf Hitler. And basically, and I think studying 33, 1933, 1934 in Germany would be, um, could, could be a metaphor basically that you could use to talk about the now. I said something terrible, I think, you know? <laughs> no, I mean, it's true, because back then, I mean, Hitler had taken the, the most, you know, the country in the big, deepest poverty, and he turned around and got rid of it, while America was still at 20%, I think, um, unemployment at the time. So, I mean, you're, if you take a look at that, it, there's a truism to what you said. Of course, nothing is the same, of course, and uh, what, what, n nothing will happen in the United States like happened in Germany in 1933-34. Clearly not. But I think I read an article, an uh, interview with Michael Moore, basically saying uh, you, uh, uh, you should read a book that is called Friendly Fascism. Friendly Fascism is, a, is, a, uh, is about fascism of, of, of with a smile. And I think that that's what we might be facing. So I think, I'm thinking about, the, of course you try to react as, a, as an artist to, the, to what's happening around you, but I think if you make it, to, to, if you immediately go for that and, and, and try to uh, use the, the now for a movie, I think you failed because you're too close. Okay, on that sobering note, we have to end it. Uh, but uh, enjoy the film, and if you tomorrow, Paul is back uh, for Turkish Delight um, and for Showgirls. So do join us as well if you can. I want to thank Casper for coming, and Paul, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Yes, thank you. Thank you.